my powers, I will show you where they go. You like the wind, I tell you where it goes. Clean as you go, clean as you go, clean as you go. My energy, I'll show you where to go You want the rivers, let me show you where they flow Clean as you go, clean as you go Clean as you go You want the highest building in your town my trees, I don't see them around here no You wanna more. go to Mars, but the soil is full of mercury Keep my water clean, free from BBC How many pieces of plastic in the Tennessee River? I hope this makes you see things clearer Hundred thousand acres, betrayed your maker. Floating in the river, mostly plastic bottles. What is so polluted? I don't see my own reflection. Call a mother, but where's your affection, my child? Where's your affection, my child? Coffee House Simon Michaud. I am pleased to have you. Uh, we have been trying to get together for quite a while. And for those of you who don't know Dr. Michaud, he's an associate professor of geometallurgy at the Geographical Survey of Finland. He's got a PhD in mining engineering, and he has got a story. He published a very large paper that came out in 2021, which is called Assessment of the Extra Capacity Required of Alternative Energy Electrical Power Systems to Completely Replace Fossil Fuels. So at that, welcome. Welcome, Simon. Hello, Sandy. Thanks for having me. Well, I'd like to actually start. I mean, we, we, we know most of our people know 
about peak oil and 2005 being the peak oil and then we had the fracking boom and 2018 was your date. Um, so the whole thing then looks at after peak oil, where do we go from here? And the where do we go from here, at least for the Westerners in the United States, was, oh, we're going to have a green new deal and we're going to be, uh, technology is going to do it for us. And it's very simplistic thinking. So can you address that to start? The simplistic thinking in this, which is, I think, why you wrote your report. So for a start, the 2018 uh, localized peak oil, we won't really know till about November 2023, but it, it is looking like that probably will be peak oil. I, I can't see them recovering uh, anytime soon. But peak oil has become more complicated. So instead of actually making gasoline out of oil, we're making gasoline out of natural gas mm. as well. And so, so the, the amount of natural gas is making it to the market is, uh, looks like it might actually surpass the 2018 level, but not for very long uh, because we, we're actually out of money. Um, and so what we call peak oil uh, was probably going to have to evolve into a more complex concept. So um, there is a great deal of simplistic thinking in all of our strategic planning. And I'm coming to the conclusion that the whole thing's a PR campaign to keep us quiet. Wow. That's pretty it's heavy. Just not doing, it's just not doing any work. Like, like, and, and, they, and they know that they're, they're about to be politically held accountable for not doing work in a fashion where both political groups all over the world are equally compliant in not doing any work. Yet there is legally enforceable uh, uh, deadlines like 2030 to have one third of the system completely electrified. So, yeah. And so there's a lot of um, very simplistic thinking. They just, just haven't thought it through. That there's no, there's a distinct lack of hard numbers, hmm. uh, and everyone seems to think this is someone else's problem. That is, uh, that that does sound about right. You know, that's yeah. and the the pushing it over. Oh, it'll be fine. Everything will be fine. We will, <laughs> we will just have. Well, everything yeah. is fine. <laughs> everything is fine. fine, but it's not, and we know. Yeah. So yeah. Give us so. So to replace so to, um, fossil fuels, oil in particular is quite a complex system, uh, more complex than anything else we've had historically. And, uh, um, a guy called uh, Robert Hirsch wrote a report in 2005 for the US Department of Agriculture to look at once we had a replacement for oil, mm -hmm. how long would it take to actually phase the oil systems out and phase in the substitute? And the answer was 20 years. Right, uh, 10 years if you would take it to, say, a forced march industrial uh, industrialization like what happened in World War II in, say, the British Isles and, and in America. But even if we did that now, uh, we don't have the money because we're also saturated in debt, so we actually can't do anything. Uh, so whether peak oil was 2018, five years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, four and a half years ago, sorry, ago, okay. Uh, or whether it's in a year or two's time doesn't matter uh, because it, it, it's around now. So to replace, and, and we have yet to actually sort of get a replacement system. So if, if like if we want to actually have electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cells and solar panels and wind turbines, uh, we've got to build all those things. Like a wind turbine, for example, uh, harvests wind and wind is renewable, but the wind turbine itself wears out. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you, you've got to build it, and then twenty years later, you've got to pull it down and build another one. And so, as Nate Hagens has, has put it out, there is they're replaceables; they're not renewables at all. They're replaceables, love it. Right, and so um, all of those wind turbines, solar panels, and everything that uh, they need an unprecedented amount of metals, and uh, usually metals are quite exotic. That we don't use very much of. Like we don't really use a lot of lithium or cobalt at the moment, but we need quantities like, you know, copper and aluminium. And, and so it can't be recycled because the system hasn't been constructed yet. 1% of vehicles are EVs, you know, 4 or 5% of primary energy is, is you know, renewable. You know, you, we, uh, you can't recycle something that hasn't been constructed yet. So this is actually a mining problem. And um, as uh, 
all of those wind turbines and solar panels are actually made from a material. They're actually all replacing an oil system. And mm. so, and they come from minerals, minerals in the ground. So minerals are actually the new oil. And so here's the difficult part. If, if the environmental activist movement does not join hands with the mining industry, then the green transition cannot happen because there is no other source for, the, the, for those metals. Right. Oh, boy. So they're they're going to have to merge. Those two groups will have to merge. Uh, we don't have enough to do this, but fossil fuels are going. There's no two ways about that. But um, And the only technologies we've got to replace fossil fuels is electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cells and solar panels at the moment. We just don't have the ability to make enough of them. No. So what's probably going to happen? In fact, uh, when you make these sort of ideas and and, and, and predictions, uh, but then then a, a a news article will come out you know, demonstrating it. Uh, I said we, we're probably not going to be able to get uh, purchase these things on the market, and that's going to be the rate determining step. Well, um, a couple of days ago, China declared that they're going to ban the export of rare earth magnets. Um, so uh, there goes any electrical motors or wind turbines or anything like that. All gone. That is pretty heavy. Um, so and you uh, did barely see a peep. You don't see much of it in the in the social media spheres. Oh uh, well, those things are heavily controlled, and the, the, those social media platforms that are, are to guide narrative, they're not uh, the town square social discussion no. that that uh, they're supposed to be. Like Twitter, when when Musk took it over, he found that something like something like half of all accounts were bots, right? So, and that means that whole platform was to guide a narrative. Wow. And 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 I think there is a, a number of very serious problems to face society at the moment. And if the public became aware of those problems, there would be serious panic. And the people who I think have a plan, but we're not part of that plan, would prefer we stay quiet for as long as possible. And those are the 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 Klaus Schwabs of the world. The uh... no, I call, there's two groups here. Okay. The first group I call the uh, you know the ass clowns or the, or the clown puppets. Fits for us. Uh, <laughs> and so um, the, the first group are, are people like Klaus Schwab and George Soros and. And you know David Rockefeller, they're the visible. They're sure. the visible. Um, uh, you could call them the wankers. Uh, these are the people we we can see. Now the, they actually that work time. for uh, uh, um, a, another group, and I call them the Muppets of Cutthroat Island. And those are the people who control all the hedge funds. funds are, are kind of like the biker gangs of the investment world, not necessarily because they like to ride fast machines or they might have dubious hygiene habits, although that also may be true. It's because they're one percenters, right? Biker gangs like to say that they're the one percent of the motorcycle club community that doesn't obey the rules. Well, hedge funds happen to manage about one percent of all of the assets under management in the US. And because they are unregulated, it means they don't have to obey some of the rules either. Now, on the surface of it, they look a lot like regular pension or mutual funds, right? You know, you go to investors, you get a bunch of money, you invest that money in certain securities and you make more money. Well, because they're unregulated, hedge funds have a lot more freedom than these other funds, kind of like motorcycle gangs. Firstly, they can buy whatever the heck they like, right? Not just stocks or bonds or whatever it is. They can buy fine art or fine wine or rare earths or any other commodity, whatever they fancy. Secondly, they can invest in pretty much any way that they like. You know, they can use derivatives. They can sell short. They can and they do use leverage, which is where they go out and they borrow vast amounts of money in order to make their investments. Next, they can charge pretty much whatever they want. Most hedge funds charge investors who put money into their funds 2% of the money that comes in, and then they take 20% of any profits at the end of the year. Finally, hedge funds can manage their funds in pretty much whatever way they like. That includes locking the funds up, which means that investors can't get their money back before a certain period. Now, if all of this makes it sound like investing in a hedge fund is kind of risky, well, that's because it is risky, which is why the only people who can invest in hedge funds 
are so-called accredited or sophisticated investors. What does that mean? Well, it basically means they're wealthy and they also have enough experience and savvy and know-how to understand what it means to get into bed with a bunch of outlaws, which could probably leave most of us rather badly needing a drink. And all the tax havens and all the money. And I don't believe that we know who they are. You know, they, they, they're not known who they are. You can infer their presence. So you've got the visible layer, but you've got, you've got the layer that's it's, it's not apparent who they are, but I think they're the true architects of all this. And so they're a layer higher than the billionaire class, the world billionaire class, a yeah. mix of well, the political and the billionaire class. Yeah, and the banks. So the true power source doesn't, you know, doesn't want to operate out in the open. They want to be left alone and do their thing. Does the true power source want to get off fossil fuels? Hmm, interesting question. I don't think they care. It's what makes money. It's what makes, it's, it's not, they've already got all the money. Yeah. I would say it's the maintenance of power. Okay. They the want power, They want I to make you. sure maintain their power, place of power in society. Um, if they got off fossil fuels, they'd want to control whatever the after fossil fuels plan actually is. And that's what you're working on. Yeah, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, hmm, I see a world where um, for the last century, things become becoming increasingly uh, You know, wh wh whatever system you happen to look at, it's controlled from a central point. Yeah. And I can see all that for the next century, everything's breaking up and becoming more decentralized. And so you'll have the solution, whatever that is, replicated many times. And that's not something that, that fits with the existing uh, business model, if you will. Yeah, business yeah. as usual. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it, it replicates. It's not energy efficient, <laughs> to, so to speak. No. So, like, uh, every region has its own challenges, right? Like, like yeah. everyone's different. And so whatever region you happen to be in, you've got a different list of challenges and a different list of opportunities. Right, so the idea of being managed from a central point is almost never going to work, at least for the benefit of most people. It will only work for the benefit of the centralised control structure. It's not the most efficient method for the people on the ground anyway. And you know, there's, and, and the, the, if we're moving into a low energy world where there's just less available, then the system will have to shrink and it will have to become less complex. Sorry, and, but that's the, that's and that's thing. where Nate comes in with the great simplification. Hmm. That's right. I said, and it, uh, it makes sense. There is a, there is uh, um, all existing technology requires a just-in-time supply grid that's spread over the whole planet. Right. That's just the way we've evolved. But um, if we were to recognise that there are new limitations, and apply our education and ability to innovate to create a new technology that recognises those limitations, what would that be? Right, so so if, if we all cut the crap and science the shit out of everything, what would happen? Cut the crap and science the shit out of everything. It's a very interesting uh, concept. <laughs> you know, I, I can't help but think of the word degrowth, and I wondered if that enters into this paradigm. So degrowth is another way of saying reducing complexity. Uh, and, and instead of having lots of a high quantity of um, low quality things, you have a small quantity of high quality things. So everything we do is now done for a very good reason mm -hmm. or not at all. Right? right. And so when we design something, we design it to be recycled and we design it with resources that we collect ourselves instead of someone from the other side of the planet. <sighs> And when we make stuff, it will have to be to simp with simpler alloys, simpler technology. Um, and we, 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 there's also a different social contract at the center of all this. You, you, you end up sort of, uh, uh, what's the right way? What's the right way? You, you, we value people instead of things. Yeah. Wouldn't right? that be and, novel? Um, yeah. And so we'll, like, like common sense isn't that common. <laughs> so. Uh, but you know, like, like another way of saying it is what we want, what we need, and what we do are all the same thing. And at the moment, that's definitely not the case. 
Well, not now. Yeah. Uh, no, but but we might be forced into that. So extrapolate that. Forced into it. Pull something out. Tell us what that looks like. Okay. Um, your ability to buy stuff, mm -hmm. you might have the money, but it's not available in the store. For example, uh, so this will hit the components industry first. Okay. Now, when we make something, mm -hmm. uh, let's say you have a computer. So the computer is made up of components. You've got the motherboard, you've got the keyboard, you've got the screen. They're all made in separate factories all over the world. Right? And you've got raw materials to make those components. So you've got multiple stages of manufacture before you get the end output that we call the computer. Right? So things are going to go off the rails for the components first. Right? And, uh, for example, China bans the export of rare earth element magnets. Which is so anything, anything that with, a, with an electric motor in it all of a sudden will become unavailable because that component's not available. Yeah, it's, it's like when you drive available a to who though? Who are they banning it? It's export so, point export. blank for the anyone, entire anyone, planet. Anyone outside China? Well, that's what they said. What they do might be a different thing. Mm -hmm. They might, for example, have a relationship with uh, other BRICS nations. Okay, because like, we are. We're, in, we're, we're in this. Uh, there is actually a. Uh, an interface between um, the Western world and the BRICS nations. And that's a conflict of our making. It didn't have to be that way. And it's the way the West has done things for the last 80 years. Yeah, so thanks. It's the same a quiet part out loud, but but, but it's, it's obvious for anyone who can see it. So, um, yeah. And so, so what, what ends up happening is um, things aren't going to make it to market. So we're going to have things like the finance system get disrupted, okay? Uh, but even if we did have the ability to marshal finance and capital, the fact that uh, we can have the ability to buy stuff like we do now is going to become different. Yeah, it's going to go away. They, the these different countries, African countries, they want to westernize. They want what we have. Mm -hmm. Don't realize. Sure. Yeah. So there's a conundrum right there uh, with, how to will that balance? Will that balance it out? Nope. Nope. So, so what what we're looking at here is uh, first of all, you need to to deliver what is needed, the absolute needs for every human being on the planet, right? So that's that's one level. Then you've got this imbalance between what the West harvests, and they generally exploit other countries to do it, and then you've got other countries that are actually under the average. And they're you know scraping the by and they've got poverty and all that. So this disruption that's coming is not going to be a nice quiet evening, evening out of everything. Um, I, I can just sort of see like markets are going to be disrupted all over the place, and a lot of the um, things that we don't need all of a sudden will become available. You, you, you imagine like a, 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 a Walmart, like a store full of say big screen TVs, but there's no electrical power to run them. That's right. Right. Uh, right, right, right. But at the same time, uh, the availability of, say, uh, food like flour and corn and, and, and wheat and any byproducts from that are spotty. They're not as easy to get hold of. Right. And, and so the, our ability to maintain what we need is, is, I think, going to be disrupted in ways that we don't really understand. And that's going to happen to everyone all over the planet. The poorer countries are probably better able to meet with that because that happens, that's what happens to them now. And they've managed to evolve a resilience to meet that. Whereas the Western countries are very used to stuff arriving. Oh, stuff arriving all the time, including myself. Uh, stuff arriving, yeah. things happening, uh, like with the, you know, magical thinking, it's just going to be here. And do you have a time frame? Do you see it happening and unfolding now? So historically, like, like say the American War of Independence, for example, the way we look at it, that seems to have happened in a couple of weeks, right? But the reality is it happened over a 20-year time period. And it, it, it for 2020 hindsight, it was a relatively short period of time. But when you're in it, it was one damn thing after another for years. And I think that's what's happening to us now. You can see in the markets the start of what we later called the global financial crisis in 2008 started in 2005 with a blowout in metal right. price. So in the slide stack that I sent you, 
-hmm. right? Slide number five shows that. Okay. Right. And so you can sort of see that sort of blowout. Ever since then, it's been one damn thing after another, and the system's been held together with quantitative easing or the printing of money. MMT, and then, the yep, modern and monetary but, theory. But it, it's required larger chunks of printing. Uh, it, each, each application is larger than ever before. Mm -hmm. And there's a new record set each time they do it. And so I call that the road to Zimbabwe. In 2008, they had hyperinflation in Zimbabwe. And before it all crashed, they had a $100 trillion note, which was worth about 30 euro. Oh, my gosh. Right. And, and that's actually the natural progression. There, there are no exceptions to that rule. But all fiat currencies will go that path, especially when the people who administer that currency don't adhere to their own rules. <laughs> that that uh, 1% governing, the governing dark bodies that we're talking about <laughs> the above layer there's, there's two schools of thought here one is they're stupid and one is they're not stupid yeah right so did this happen by accident or did they really mean it right now they're not stupid i'm of the opinion they're not stupid but this is a known quantity and so they knew that this set of circumstances was coming and they're maneuvering to be at the right place at the right time to mm. manage that transition. So whatever happens on the other side of this transition, they still maintain their position of authority. And transition it is. I mean, it is happening no matter what anybody likes to say that they don't want to see it happen. It's happening. It's going to happen. It's just, years in. pardon me? We're, eight, we're 18 years into it. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of so, people are, you know, a lot. we have people that will say, well, we don't want to see any of this. Okay. We want humans to go extinct. People who talk in those sort of terms do tend to think like this is someone else's problem. Mm. And what they mean is that everyone else is to go extinct. Right. <laughs> and they're, they're not going to volunteer to go first, for example. So there's a level of hypocrisy in all humans. who and uh, like the, We're a very unemotional species. We're very tribal. And at a subconscious level, we tend to... At a subconscious level, we decide emotionally what we are prepared to accept what is true and what is not. And that is a filter which allows us to accept data or not, which is why you can't talk to anyone about any of this. And everyone say ideologically, uh, ideological and tribal, and they're right and everyone else is wrong. Not only that, and, and it's any debate is about conquest. You know, I will shut you down and I will destroy you. Yeah. And I will prove you wrong. Rather, the original debate that the Greek philosophers dreamed of, like Pythagoras, a debate was for us to learn something. Absolutely. Right? We, we would have an exchange and we would learn something, and everyone in that debate would come away wiser. That's not what we've become. <sighs> I don't even have a name for what we've become, but you're right. Um, there is no so, debate. See, see it as an evolution. Like, like in the 16th century in Europe, uh, we were in a terrible state. You know, uh, this was before the Age of Reason kicked off, uh, and it, we were very sort of superstitious, and 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 it, 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 accusations were flying all over the place that yeah. that resulted in such bloodshed. And then we had the Age of Reason, but now we've gone back to that. What we call cancel culture has the same feel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the witch, yeah, the witch burning culture. The, the yes, of, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. right. And so, and so, then there's going to be a societal backlash um, from that. And it says we are sick of that. We are not going to do that. Yeah, at, at the moment, there's a the, all that uh, uh, the controversial about you know the Bud Light uh, beer uh, and, and, and everything. That is actually a society backlash to a strategy. So it's actually wider, wider at a subconscious level than the beer itself, and so everyone's understanding. Oh, I don't get it. Why, why is this? It's just beer, but actually, it's a backlash for something else. So what was it? So I think that uh, there was a um, a back up a bit. In 1983, a KGB there. defector mm -hmm. had come in from the Soviet Union through Canada. His name was Yuri Brezhnev. Oh. Remember. Right. Now, he actually gave a uh, YouTube, uh, an interview, and it's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's about an hour long. 
And he describes a situation where the Soviet Union uh, had developed a, a way, um, a system or a procedure to soften up and destabilize an adversary. Ideological subversion is, is the slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, active мероприятия in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided. Right, the first stage is demoralization, second stage is crisis, and the third stage is you've actually got the kinetic shooting war. Right, and he was saying this will happen through the education system. And there were two vectors, one's to go left and one's to go right. And what's happening to us now, <laughs> if they had gotten through the left in the education system, and so a lot of what's actually happening is to get us to fight amongst ourselves by getting society to turn on itself so we have no Absolutely. moral fiber or strength when there is difficulty. I want to segue a little bit with you because we were earlier talking about labels. We were talking about labeling and we were talking about um, uh, how... It's not actually, a, it's not a good thing. And I wanted to take, ha, hear your take on that, you know, labeling, are we technophobes, you, you know, you, uh, doomers. Um, yeah. Give me your so feelings. The, the problem with labeling is it pigeonholes you into uh, a solution set, but there are no real solutions yet because we don't really understand the full complexity of what we're dealing with. We've got multiple problems. Uh, on the books at the moment, and very few people, if any, actually have their arms around all of them, right? So any given s solution set that any given tribe has at the moment is most certainly only going to be part of the solution, even if it's correct, right? So a label is inherently um, wrong because it, a, a, label would, would, uh, um, a label does not actually help um, find a solution set at all. No, it brushes you to a corner and it just, it kind of minimizes the person that you're labeling. And there are a yeah. lot on social media that do this and it doesn't do any good. I, I agree with you. So. And it actually it limits your ability to do anything. Right? You've now got to sit with this in this uh, uh, pigeonhole box unless you want to break out of that box, which the dialogue won't let you. If you, if you subscribe to that horseshit. So what do we do? No, it's bullshit. <laughs> so, I like thinking in terms of systems. And what that does is it connects different issues together and their relationships to it. And everything's connected to everything else. And that, that thinking, if you keep going down that rabbit hole, will eventually connect to everything. Right. And so when you make a change somewhere in that system, it pulls on up on everything else in some form. And the magic of that is actually the relationship between the groups. So it's not the labels themselves, it's the relationship between them. Right? And that's actually what's missing from the current dialogue. And so if we start doing that, you know, you know, what you ask, what's our fundamental question of our age? What is it that we are really seeing? Right? Yeah, and, instead and, and, of what should we be asking, it's what should yeah. we be seeing? Because the, what, what is it we are looking at and how do we understand it? And is what we are told to look at the whole thing, or is only part of it, or is it even correct? Are, are we being pushed in the wrong direction? Are we being shown a bright, shiny thing off off over here when we really should be looking over there? What is uh, over there? Okay, so, so you, um, like a stage magician, mm -hmm. distracts the audience with one hand, while on the other hand he does the he does the stage trick. I think a lot of what's happening today in in the modern world is a distraction while the serious stuff is actually sort of happening under the under the radar. And the serious stuff is things like we are slowly creeping into a more uh, surveillance-based state. Like oh, well, what, what the East German Stasi had actually achieved that they wish they could have actually achieved with what's actually available right now. 
and, and in place. Uh, another one is uh, a lot of our currencies are going to default and to be replaced with a central bank controlled cryptocurrency or, or a Bitcoin, Bitcoin equivalent. You see that happening for sure. That's think, just a natural. The scary, the scary step behind that is a social credit system, which they've already, you know, which they're going to use the environmental movement to do. Uh -huh. Right, you know the you know, the ESG, you know, the ESG idea, uh, your carbon credits. Yes. The central system to manage your carbon credits is going to limit your ability to spend money, but the rules of doing that are written by people who are not democratically elected or accountable to the people. Right, and so while they've got the label, if you like, yeah, the what they're really doing is actually something else. Right, and so that's happening. Meanwhile. We're being convinced to argue about who's going to the toilet. We've been encouraged to to join a tribe, and once we're in that tribe, we're encouraged to fight other tribes. <laughs> and different tribes are actually walked out and then pointed at each other, right? And 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 I this is actually quite clear in the United States at the moment. It's happening all over the world, uh -huh. right? Like and like, like the the clearest example I've seen in a long time. Um, remember, uh, was it a year ago now that the, the Supreme Court had a leak that yeah. they were thinking about overturning the Roe versus Wade ruling? Yeah, and that so. really pissed off the entire le le left wing. But they did it at a right. time when they actually gave them time to organise a rally. Right, gave them time to organise out in mass in, in a rally. At the same time, in the in the same geographical areas, the group that that were diagnosed as the right, the label. Right, were antagonized with a different set of actions and they were given at the same time time to organize and deploy in a rally. Yeah, they sure and were. They, they, were then, they were then brought out and then they were pointed at each other. A few inflammatory things would have been said in the media and then security forces would have stepped back and let them go for it. Right, And, and it, it didn't work out that way. And this happened just before a political election. And so there is no left or right, really, they're part of the same bird, and that bird's about to be served up as Peking duck, right? It, 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 it's it's not. Uh, um, it is a largely illusionary divide that many many of us are are, are being coerced and convinced to be pushed into. Mm -hmm. When the real issues that sit under that, like can I have enough food for my family? Mm -hmm. How am I going to actually pay my bills? I'm saturated with debt. Uh, how will my kids be able to be educated? Uh, you know, all of these big ticket structural things for society, mm -hmm. the tide is rising around all of us. And, and that's, that oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That's not just the United States. Everywhere. Everywhere. But Everywhere. we just don't hear about how serious things are in countries that are closed. We don't know how that, how this is happening in North Korea, for instance, but it's happening yeah. worldwide. There's actually some fairly place. serious civil unrest in China at the moment, uh, as I understand it. I'm only getting fragments of the information right. uh, um, uh, that, that are sort of coming out. But uh, as difficult as things are, you know, w we still have the better end of the deal mm. at the moment. We uh, you know, it, it's actually much more difficult in some parts of the world. And so many people don't understand that or they want to minimize the fact that, you know, even though the United States or the Western world, we have our we have terrible things happening at the hands of the police, for instance, mm -hmm. at least yeah. in, in the UK. Extinction Rebellion is still able to be out on the streets. The United States is getting more clamped down on that kind of talk. It's but um, the other countries, there's no right to dissent yeah that's so right yeah. we in the west that can at least get out there civil disobedience or exercise any of it we be th we should be thanking our lucky stars and because it's going away so it's also the whole environmental movement has been convinced to go after carbon pollution in particular right but you don't hear a lot of discussion for example about species die-off or ocean acidification or land degradation. You know, the entire bottom of the food chain from the bacteria in the sea Absolutely. to the insect populations and small bird populations, the climate change models don't do anything to recognise any of that. And as, as such, it's, it's never really discussed. 
And they should be it, intersecting. Yeah. It has to be. It has but to the, be discussed. But the, but the money, the money involved with all this sort of stuff wants us to look at carbon pollution at the exclusion of everything else. But if we actually stop producing carbon tomorrow, but we did everything else, we'd be in just as much trouble. And in fact, if you were to, to, to go from a, um, an air war to a land war, if you were to mine everything to make the green transition, okay. the environmental, if you imagine if the mining industry had to expand by 5,000%. Uh, I had wanted to bring that up with you. Where is all yeah. this coming? Where is going to happen? Where are we getting all this copper, nickel, lithium, cobalt, vanadium, all of it? Where is it going to come from? No, so I can't imagine. The, the entire Andes mountain range in South America is one giant copper deposit that's really, really low grade. Right. And so it's not a question of running out of copper, but our ability to actually access that copper is the problem. You know, um, is, if it's too low grade or the, or the little bits of copper metal in the ore is too fine mm -hmm. um, it, or it's just, just too much energy to actually consume or potable water to consume to actually get to the point where you can actually get the copper. And, uh, and you know, now we've come up with a great idea of let's mine the seafloor. But even even the <sighs> reserve, the, even the resources that we're of, um, aware of on the seafloor, that's not enough either. And so the conclusion is this whole thing's a dumbass idea and we should actually ha make a better plan, right? And instead of actually trying to actually replace the system as it is now with as large and complex as it is, design a new system that's much smaller and less complex and needs less resources. And once you build something, you build it in a form where it can be recycled locally, and that's not the case at the moment. And so is, we've got to change the way we do things. Of course. However, there are those that will say because of the CO2 problem, and I, and, and you know, we subscribe to that and <laughs> the, uh, the PPM of parts per million of CO2 has been growing. So if that does not level out somehow, there yeah. won't be time, will there? There won't be the ability to, to at least now I, you know, you know, technically uh, figure out so, our way out, a way out. So I, I'm part geologist and yeah. as a geologist, the planet has been through many, many, iterations of massive climate change in the past but it's been the life on earth that has actually stabilized the system going through what's happening now we're disrupting those regulation systems so it's like taking the damping controls off an oscillating system where the, where the oscillations get bigger and bigger and bigger than the wheels fall off mm -hmm. right uh, and so um if we had robust life systems even if we did go into a uh, um, climate change spiral, the planet could regulate and reach a new equilibrium if we had health, healthy ecosystems. Yeah, which we but, don't. So, so, yeah, and, and so so we, we can still make changes if we make big changes, but we've got to withdraw our industrial footprint, both in, in, in terms of industry and in terms of food production, away from certain sectors of the natural environment and then help it replenish. And then we've got to do things like clean up some of the pollution plumes that have been created that are going to take a long time to get rid of. And I'm talking about the plastics in the sea. PFAS, oh, yes. Because you know, they're not going to go away for a long, long, long time unless we take them out. We came up with an idea of putting a pyrolysis plant on a ship and sending that ship out into the sea, into the gyre uh, in the center of the Pacific Ocean, bringing in all the plastic. Pyrolysis heats plastics and stuff it without oxygen. And what it does is it breaks down to a liquid that's much, much smaller in volume, and that liquid can be distilled into diesel fuel. So what you do, like a, like a, a, a biofuel of sorts. So what you do is you harvest all that plastic, and it contracts down to, to oil, but you're taking it out of the ocean. Yeah. Right. And it's and going to be used anyway. Our systems are oil dependent now. Yeah. And they're going to be for a while because we haven't built the next system. No. Right. But where do we get the diesel from to run those systems? If you can actually extract it out of the sea and clean up a mess at the same time. Right. <sighs> and then use, and use that for, say, emergency services. You know, yeah. uh, 
right, right. Yeah. There are solutions if we choose to look at them. Um, uh, uh, chain reaction kind of way will start to turn things around. And there's, the, there's a whole series of them. Some of them aren't that sexy, and some of them are. Right? Uh, uh, but but it, it requires us to, as I said before, cut the crap. Yeah. Um, and 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 start start applying some of these solutions. They don't have to be big. You don't need a centralized uh, uh, carbon credit system to do this stuff, right? You just need to knock out some systems and replace them with other systems. And yeah. Yeah. we're probably not going to do this do this for eight billion people. But if you do it for some, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and, and meanwhile, the vast majority of the people around me refuse to see any of these issues. And as such, if they refuse to see the issues and they refuse to do anything about them, then they get Darwinized. And it's their own choice. Mm-hmm. What you do is you go find like-minded people and you make a lifeboat. I need to write that one down. Like-minded mm-hmm. people and make a lifeboat. Yep. I like yep. it. Yep. So tell and, us and about your lifeboat. So well, I'm sitting in Finland at the moment, okay. and Finland has a number of things in it which are truly remarkable. And um, there is there is an honesty here, which there is a trust in society. People trust their government, and the government is worth trusting. Corporations proudly pay their tax, so the government has a lot of money, and then they spend that money on the community. That is obvious. <sighs> Sounds like utopia. Right. Uh, no, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. But coming from Australia, uh, which is a very, very different kettle of fish, oh, right? Yeah. So Finland's a relatively small population, five five point six, I think it is, million people, embedded in a. You know, it's I, I call it the Star Trek society embedded in a, a pristine wilderness. Seventy five percent of Finland is pristine forest, right? Uh, they, they've got a, a highly educated. Uh, population, eighty percent of electricity is already generated in non-fossil fuel systems. They've got heavy industry already running off non-fossil fuel systems. It, it, there's a reasonably high percentage of electric vehicles here. The people who get in early are going to do okay. The people who wait till the prices come down, they might find the run available. I see. Mm. Right. Uh, Finland also thinks in terms of bad things happen, and we need to be prepared. So the Finnish government has a stockpile of food and necessities for everyone in Finland for eight months. Now, I've never heard that anywhere else in no, the world. No, it isn't. In, uh, in the United States, it's just people doing it for themselves, independent of the government, you know. Right. So, so the Finns don't like to promote themselves. They don't strut up and down the stage shouting how good they are. They just quietly get on with things and tell no one. Right. And I think the rest of the world can learn from that. Uh, so the people in Finland, I, I'm, I'm presenting my work to multiple parts of the Finnish government mm-hmm. and parts of the Swedish government. They're not rejecting it. They don't like it, but they, they, they go, well, okay, let's discuss it. And they, you know, these are the facts, these are the numbers. What the hell do we do about it? I'm hearing a level of honesty and integrity there that I'm not seeing anywhere in the Western world. Right? So who, who knows how it's all going to pan out? But there are there are strengths in Finland that are not elsewhere, and that comes down to the culture that is here. Okay. Um, yeah. So and there is are it, other things. That... Is it a culture of diversity in Finland? Diversity of ideas. Um, they've had their share of groups that have tried to come in and overrun them. The Soviets, when they tried to invade in nineteen thirty nine mm-hmm. or whenever it was, gave them a nasty scare. Yeah. And since then, they have been looking very, very strongly about what to do. They do tend to collaborate with their neighbours. Um, it depends on what you call uh, diversity. Well, uh, I like the diversity of ideas that that yeah. that the 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 discourse in, is not uh, confrontational. So no, it's not. Not even, not even remotely confrontational. What I would also say is, in the Western world. Men and women are at war with each other because they've been encouraged to be so. None of that horseshit is, happens here. 
like uh, men and women just work together just fine in the workplace. They just do. They just get on with it, and they don't understand why people are so aggressive in Australia, Canada, United States, New Zealand, Ugh. British Isles. We don't even think now, of people in New Zealand as, as aggressive yeah, compared to well, the United they're, States. They're, uh, men and women have been encouraged to go to war with each other. My the God. level of distrust between the sexes is an all-time bad position. You know, it, it's just it, it's appalling. And it's encouraged to be so. Like, like, like uh, when I was in Australia, and, and I don't believe this is actually a natural thing. So when I was in, uh, um, in Australia once, there were bushfires, bushfires across like massive chunk, chunks of it. And, and there were all these, these uh, um, firefighters going out and you know, like the volunteer groups. These fires are so large, you know, the official uh, are overwhelmed. And while firefighters are leaving their families in their homes to risk their lives to fight bushfires and save other people's homes, someone stood up and, and, and presented a study with a politician standing next to them that these firefighters were going home and beating their wives. Now, that study turned out to be bogus. Wow. Like, 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 it was, it was uh, flawed. You know, it, it, you know, right. Uh, and the politician in question, this was in the Green Party, did not retract any of that until they saw the public backlash. Mm. And when I saw that, I thought Australia is not worth defending. I would not risk my life to go out and fight a bushfire now to defend the homes of others. And I went away and thought, that's not natural. That's counterintuitive. Why am I thinking and feeling that? And I went away and thought about it. Actually, what it does is it causes distrust. And back to that Yuri Brezhnev uh, idea, demoralization. Parts of society will no longer come to the aid of others. Instead, they'll fight each other, Bite doing the job for someone else. And I'm seeing that at multiple stages, and it's very prevalent right across the Anglo cultures. It is not in the Scandinavian cultures. We're seeing some amazing things in America, amazing things that you, you think, that's not possible, surely not. There is an honesty and integrity here, and there's a system that can be audited by anyone, anyone. Right, so uh, right. Uh, uh, any particular financial activity at all can be found and checked by anyone should, should they choose to do so. Okay. Right, uh, and so it's very hard to hide. Corruption does happen here, I suppose, after a fashion, but it's in a very different form. And it's not in the same way that it actually happens um, um, elsewhere. But in, the, in you, know, you know, America, the British Isles, the, the, it, it's... it's pretty clear that the communities on the ground are being targeted by their own government. This is a very compelling <laughs> information. So the people who are find this stuff challenging, I, I urge them to check it out for themselves. Uh, check out that Yuri Brezhnev yeah, uh, interview. Right? Watch the whole thing and then look around you what you're seeing now. There was also a couple of... Uh, um, you know, there, there, there's some old documents, for example, from the 60s. So one was Quiet Weapons to Silent Wars, and the other one was Report from Iron Mountain. They've been debunked, and they're now called satire, political satire. Oh, really? That might be the case, but they happen to describe what's happening to us around us now. <laughs> Hang on. Who blew up the Nord 2, Nord 2 pipes line? Well, the conventional wisdom mm -hmm. says the Americans did. Yeah, but, but so, so if they did, if that is true, and I, I believe that is the case, that's actually an act of war against Germany, <laughs> who happens to be the American ally. Yeah. All of this, you know, and I'm going to be honest, I, I find so much of this so stressful <laughs> and so anxiety producing, but it is reality. Well, now we've got the problem of, um, so the Americans put out the Inflation Reduction Act, and that what they want to do is actually attract business back to America. That was actually written and passed at the time when the Americans were actually coercing the Europeans to apply economic sanctions against Russia for what they were doing in Ukraine. Right, and so the Euro Europeans did, you know, because you know we, we, they, they often sort of do what the Americans ask. But what ends up happening is their own gas is cut off, and now all the heavy industry in Europe is now seriously thinking about leaving or already has left. And so we cannot operate in a place where our energy is being weaponized. Mm. Right. And where are they going? They're going to the United States. 
Ah, energy's been weaponized. Time in memoriam. Humanity at large, which is like 8 billion people, is now hitting a point where our money systems are going belly up, our energy systems are going belly up more or less at the same time, and our ability to buy stuff in a market all of it becomes inelastic and unavailable, right? What actually happens to that system, okay. right? And, and if this is actually known, how, how does people with the right kind of information, lots of resources, but who don't really care about the average person, what would they do about all that? Mm. How would they position themselves? Well, there's a few ways to look at it. They would position themselves either to, you know, the, the, to just win either way, to put their money on either side so they can win no matter where the dust falls, or you could look at the nefarious reasons. So question, the people who control the hedge funds yes. and the tax havens, do you think they care about life on earth? How could they not? They're humans. Well, or they yeah, think they're yeah. going to jet off somewhere to Mars. No, 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 no. You have to remember, they understand what happens to the rest of humanity doesn't necessarily have to happen to them because uh -huh. they're rich. Yeah. So do they care? You mean bunker babies? Oh, no, not even. You know, just <laughs> live in a you know, you know, gated community or just happen to be very far away. If no one knows who they are. This is the stuff you know, of science fiction, Simon, but it's real. Well, if you happen to be a sociopath and you had billions of US dollars to play with and you knew all this was coming and you didn't care about the people on the ground, what would you do about it? Yeah. That's, I can't even put myself into that. And, and, and if you happen to know other sociopath or psychopath billionaires, you all got together and said, "Hey guys, this is coming. What would you? What do you think? What do you think happens next? Let's let's band together and help humanity." Pigs ass. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you it makes sense to me, Simon, <laughs> because that's human nature, and we always see we see we. I mean, I like to see the best in it, but the the worst in it seems to always become the cream on the top of the coffee. You know, the worst of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so. Um, humanity at large has got to understand that we are the solution, but we're also in our in our own way, right? And then we've got to take our own power back. But once we've got our power back, what do we do with it, right? So, but how do we do that? I think it's as simple as we don't go along with it. We just we just stop. Stop no, buying tax tax debt strike. So, yeah, and so, um, you know, who, who was it in the 60s who said, like, imagine if they started a war but no one turned up to fight it? I, I used to be part of a group called Lock the Gate uh, in Australia who were activists against, you know, fracking uh, because they were trying to start a fracking campaign or they did start fracking campaigns in Australia where I used to live in a place called the Scenic Rim. Oh. And... Uh, and so I saw firsthand what was actually happening. And I saw the infrastructure going in where gas was being stripped out of the area, but it was not for domestic use because there was no infrastructure for domestic use to access it. And so nine out of 10 fracking operators were Chinese and the 10th was American. And any environmental problems, they'd point at each other and say it wasn't us. <laughs> and But the government at the time the government at the time knew all this was going to be a problem, but they changed the legal language to keep it quiet for as long as possible. And mm. because no one knew it was there, you got seven years to try and block something through through you know legal means. And if no one complains for seven years, then it can start. It's because the legal language was changed when, when you know, um, no one knew it was there, so it all started. And so those governments colluded with those corporations for royalties. Right, and, and, and so the people on the ground were facing not only the corporations themselves, but the government itself. But here's the weird thing, like like um, Saudi, not, not Saudi, right? Um, Bahrain, that's right, the no, United uh -huh. Arab Emirates uh -huh. over uh, one, one, a one-year period collected the same amount of gas that Australia did, right? Australia got 800 
US dollars in royalties, no, Australian dollars, dollars, sorry, in royalties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and let, right. Um, okay, sounds like a lot. The UAE collected the same amount of gas and collected 24 billion. Billion. It's the big be, B. Yeah. We're being screwed. We're, we're being screwed. Uh, and and as the Australian continent is being looted with the consent and compliance of their own government. Yeah. And that's absolutely horrible. But that it, it, it seems like it's just insurmountable at, some, at times. Like it's just what's going to happen until so, hang the on. planet's someone, destroyed. Someone, someone tried to tell me once that one man can't change the world or one woman can't change the world. Right. But one person can be at the right place at the right time when everything breaks. Right. So if, if you understand that everything's falling apart, and then you're trying to, you're being convinced to go in one direction. If you decide, no, no, I, I actually understand what's happening and I'm actually going to do something else, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden things are possible. Things are possible. Possibilities. Hmm. You don't go along with it. Don't fall into um, the trap of division. Don't be yeah. labeled. Don't, don't let anybody force you to pick a side. That's a big thing. Well, if you must pick a side, pick your side. <laughs> My side. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that's that's a social media construct. You know, people, the, the manufactured outrage, people getting uh, angry at mm -hmm. each other. But, uh, okay, let's move on. I, I wanted to ask you uh, about people and resilience and the future. People like all over the world that mm -hmm. are going to find ourselves in a mess and adaptation and resilience and living minimal in a minimalistic world um you know do you do you see that people can get back that collective action do you feel that and and without putting it in negative you know what, what do you see because obviously it's not going to be with eight billion people so when i was in australia uh we have the in brisbane it's a town called brisbane on the east coast north of sydney a thousand kilometers Right, so uh, they get hit with natural disasters every now and then. And every now and then Brisbane floods, the river breaks its banks and, and a whole lot of suburbs go underwater. And, and the community turns out to help the people who've been hit by the flood. We call it the mud army. You know, the mud army deploys. Everyone picks up a shovel or a rake. Uh, the city council has free buses and they're busing people from, from all over the city and they start cleaning people's driveways. And there's a whole lot of people who are making food and doing laundry and, and just trying to get people uh, on their feet. A lot of tradesmen will go in and gen, gen, um, donate their time. The council will actually buy parts and, and so on. You know, what I'm saying there is when there's an emergency, a society will put aside its normal methods of operation. And it will go, all right, we've got a problem. We pull together and the needs of that society are looked after to make sure that you know everyone's okay we're seeing that here in the states and so it's, it's uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah and so this this is what happens in an emergency and so the, there is a once people actually understand that there is an emergency and there is a problem so instead of actually so saying like one damn thing after another and people think this is normal once they actually understand what they're looking at and that they're required to change their thinking, mm -hmm. and that the people around them are actually their solution, not their enemy. Right? There'll be a, you know, let's pull together. And once you, you step outside the normal ways of doing things, and people talk to each other differently, right? I think yeah. it's going to be something like that. And in that environment, you say, yeah, this keeps happening, doesn't it? Right. And then say, so, well, okay, we, we need to sort of settle in a new way of doing things. And and perhaps we shouldn't listen to the things that were causing problems. I think that's a, a, a hard a hard thing to aspire to, but it's you don't worth a try. It. Well, it's, aspire it's, you to You find yourself in it. Okay, shit. yeah. Okay. What do I do? The shit hits the fan, you're in it. I'm talking about just generally the way <laughs> cultures are with the adversarial relationships set up that's the difficult part to kind of unstick people 
from what's so happened. What, if people become aware of what's happening and, and, and why, they're less likely to turn on each other when they understand that they're not the real target. And while they're turning on each other, they're guaranteeing their own long-term sovereignty and self-sufficiency is being damaged. While when they come to that realization, the, the normal tribes won't work anymore. The normal tribes. Mm -hmm. I don't think they've been working for a while. Oh no, they work just fine for some people. For yeah, just okay, not, uh, not, not just the people in it, just not the people in the tribes. <laughs> what I think exactly. needs to happen to, to society at large is all problems have to be put on the table at the same time, all of them, not just one or two, but also all possible solutions, including the unorthodox ones that we've previously rejected. And around that table are all stakeholders, and then we have to have an adult conversation. Right, and that's not about what tribe you happen to be in, right? Because gotcha. every single group that's out there at the moment has only part of the picture, and they may even have incomplete information that is really not helpful. Now, the next stage for me, I presented my work in 2022 91 times to some fairly you know, a, a wide range of people, but they were mm -hmm. quite uh, senior. In every single circumstance, they had the same reaction. The first one was they were shocked, that they unprepared. The second one was they were not able to debunk what I was able to show, even after they had like quite a bit of time to think about it the first time, because I, I would often come back to them a second time. The third reaction, and this happened every single time, they asked, what should we do about it? Right, and so they're asking me, which surprised me because I thought you know, other people would be looking at this. You know, I'm just I'm just a guy with a cheap computer and an <laughs> and a thousand picture. page <laughs> document. Uh, yeah, well, have you noticed anger gets shit done? Uh, when I first came to Europe, there was a distinct lack of numbers, and this is how people lose their jobs. And okay. and and I wasn't seeing it being fixed. Right, so. The next stage was they, they actually asked me to reinvent the circular economy in context of my work. Oh. And so I took, took an evolution of that I first saw in the Zeitgeist Movement and the Venus Project. I think the Venus Project was the origin of this. Mm -hmm. And the resource-based economy that yeah. they had, I refitted it, but I added energy terms. Amazing. And so now I call it the resource-balanced economy. And now that's being applied in terms of if we were to move into a low energy future, what would that look like? And so that's the, the next frontier. The big if or when? Uh, uh, the when, well, we're in it now. Hmm. When? Uh, so you're going to have like a death of a thousand cups, you know, little by little and suddenly all at once. Something big's going to break. Hmm. And then when that happens, then we'll, you know, the masks will lift and we'll see everyone as they truly are. Wow. Uh, and when will it happen? I don't know. I'm right. surprised it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Usually I say we're not in the business of prognosticating, but it, it's truly uh, compelling information. And you have uh, really opened my mind to want to go further into this, which is really this topic is the overarching topic next to also living with the co2 the you know the burning of fossil how fuels how do we live on this planet? how do we so, live on this planet and so the people listening if any of the things i've said are upsetting or you don't agree with or challenging that's fine we all think what we want but i encourage you to look at it yourself go down the rabbit hole and see if you can actually sort of find stuff for yourself it's it's obvious once you actually start to look it is obvious and the links will be in the show notes, guys. <laughs> so you'll have a, a head start for sure. Those of you that haven't yet. But, uh, well, Simon, this has been wonderful. Thank you so very much. I do look forward to following up. Thank okay. you for coming to Environmental Coffee House. Guys, take it easy. Peace out. See you guys.